Our churches all over the city are being threatened. Where 5, 10, 15 years from now, the churches that many of us grew up in, the churches that we visited, the churches that nourished us and strengthened us may no longer be in existence. And my brothers and sisters, some people say, well, uh, uh, Pastor Nelson, I hear what you're saying, but this is the inevitable tide of progress. These things happen. It's okay because there are always going to be churches around, my brothers and sisters. But what I want you to know is that uh, there is something particular about the black church that we can't afford to let it go. And I don't care how much free coffee they give you at Crossroads. <laughs> I don't care how many volunteer days they do across the city. I don't care how many cameras they bring out to public. Is a cut of the $62 million he raised for building new church buildings for Crossroads. Ask him where he was when President Trump was campaigning on an anti-Muslim anti-immigrant, anti-black people campaign? Where was their righteous indignation? Where was his thus saith the Lord? When the person who was uh, trying to attain the highest office was doing so by appealing to the lowest common denominator of people who had been disenfranchised and locked out and appealed to their fear rather than appealing to their hope and gave rise to this violence of white nationalism that we've seen across the nation. Where were they when this is happening, my brothers and sisters? I can tell you where they were. They were preaching Super Bowl sermons. They were quiet while this was happening, my brothers and sisters. They did not use their power or privilege to speak out, which is why we need the black church. Because if we are going to uh, continue to have strength, my brothers and sisters, it's going to be because we have institutions that are not bought out. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, where we are is not a new place, though, brothers and sisters. Um, this is a similar place to what's happening here in Jeremiah chapter 29. Now, I know you know this chapter because you know the 11th verse. The 11th verse is the verse we all like to read and shout about. I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord. But yes, Lord! Plans to prosper you, to give you a hope, and yes, a hope and a future. But let's slow down before we get to verse 11 and start with verse number one. This is the letter of Jeremiah to the priests and the prophets who were taken in exile when Babylon came to invade uh, Judah. When King Nebuchadnezzar came to topple uh, that sacred city and take the people out of it and bring them uh, to Babylon, uh, it was this exile, my brothers and sisters, that caught up the prophet Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a part of this exile community. Uh, the three uh, Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who you may know by their slave names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, those three Hebrew boys are part of this exile, my brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, these, uh, this exile community, Ezekiel was a part of this exile community. There is a portion of our Old Testament that occurs in exile, and Jeremiah is writing a letter to the people who are in exile. Um, he's writing to them to uh, remind them that the God that they serve is still God even while they are in Babylon. Uh, now this, my brothers and sisters, is the first uh, job of any pastor, particularly pastors of uh, black church. It is uh, to provide a sense of historical memory. 
so that we remember where we came from. Uh, there is a danger, my brothers and sisters, for the exiles once they are in Babylon that they get so uh, attached to the comforts of Babylon that they get so in love with the comforts of Babylon that they forget where they came from. That they forget what their Sunday school teacher taught them. That they forget what happened in Wednesday night Bible study in Babylon. They may be so caught up in the AAU tournaments and so caught up with the Pee Wee football that they might forget there is a reason to every once in a while go to the Lord's house to pray in Babylon. There's a danger, my brothers and sisters. So there is, he is writing a letter to the people who are exiled uh, in Babylon, which is important for us to remember, my brothers and sisters, because we too are exiles. Uh, we are strangers in a foreign land. Uh, and, and, in two ways. One, we are spiritual exiles. We are spiritual strangers. My grandmother used to sing a song. She used to say, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Uh, my brothers and sisters, that uh, uh, all the uh, entrapments and all uh, of the things that this world has to offer is not our final destination. And so we have to remember that's why we come to church on Sunday morning so that we are reminded that our life is not just about what we can attain. That even though the pressures of society try to teach us to get all we can, to can all we get, and then to sit on the can, that there is something more to life, my brothers and sisters, than what we can acquire. Uh, we come to church so that we can remember that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that live therein. And so we have an accountability, my brothers and sisters, to what we do with what we have been given us. But not only are we spiritual exiles, but we are also physical exiles. We are historical exiles. And I'm not just speaking about the fact that I was born in Detroit and now I'm here in Cincinnati. That's not what I'm talking about, my brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, but our ancestral home is not in these shores. Uh, uh, despite what the uh, horrible public education system as it relates to black history teaches us, our history did not begin on this continent. Slavery is not the origin of black people, my brothers and sisters, but uh, we, like the Babylon, like the exiles in Babylon, were ripped from our homelands. We were taken from our native shores. We were ripped from our motherland and brought here to this uh, to this country to work, my brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, and that is why in the the Negro national anthem. Uh, 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 we say that line that we will be uh, uh, true to our God and true to our native, y'all know the song uh, that native land is not Mississippi it's not Louisiana it's not Arkansas, Alabama or Georgia but that native land is the land of our foremothers and forefathers that land that has been so blessed to be kissed by God's own son. That land, my brothers and sisters, that, that bright, beautiful continent of Africa. The continent that is still being pillaged uh, uh, by white supremacy today. Uh, that continent that provides the only natural resources that power our cell phones. Don't you know you would not have a cell phone if it wasn't for Africa? Uh, but the materials they need to make the cell phone work, they take from the land of Africa. They take it without paying for it and then have the uh, unmitigated gall and audacity to charge them for aid. They want to uh, uh, say that they're doing something great when they forgive a loan to an African country. 
uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, the fact that they even can fix their mouths to say that any country in Africa owes any country in the rest of the world anything uh, is, is, the, is, is foolishness. What would it look like if I came into your house, took all of your food, took all of your kitchen supplies, and then came back the next day, tried to sell you a chicken dinner. And then when you could not pay, said, that's okay, I will forgive you your debt. Uh, but this is what is happening, my brothers and sisters, and we need to know our history so that we are not blinded by uh, the areas where white supremacy raises its head in our current context. Uh, our confusion about our history, my brothers and sisters, makes us susceptible to fall into the traps uh, that have played out before. Uh, you've heard, the, uh, you've heard the, the, the line that those who uh, have forgotten their history are doomed to repeat it. And we fall into the same historical traps over and over again, my brothers and sisters, because we do not learn our history. Uh, it's why we need the black church to remind us of who we are, to remind us of who we are, to stand up and speak strong and let, uh, and let us know that these things that are happening, uh, are, this is not the first time it's happening, it's happened before, and we can stand against it now if we remember that God has called us. That our blackness is not an accident of birth, but it is a divine destiny, my brothers and sisters. That God has given us, along with this beautiful skin, along with these gorgeous features, along with this immense talent, along with this deep spiritual soul, God has given us a destiny that the world needs, my brothers and sisters, and so we ought to hold on to it. Even if the world despises us, even if the world hates us, we ought to love each other and love one another because God has given us something that is so valuable. Uh, we need uh, to, to preach with historical memory. Uh, the second thing we need to do, my brothers and sisters, is preach with, uh, we need to preach uh, uh, with uh, relevance to the present. Jeremiah, when he writes to uh, these exiles, he writes to them and he says, um, I don't want you to be uh, deceived about what is happening. Because other preachers in Babylon were saying, um, this is only a test. This is only a season. God's going to deliver us back home before you know it. So don't worry about it. Everything is going to be all right. All you've got to do is name it and claim it. And God will bring us back home. All you got to do is blab it and grab it. All you got to do is sow your seed into this offering. And if you sow your seed into this ministry, God's going to bring us back home before, you know, all you got to do. Because God will not have God's people suffer. And so all you got to do is just pray and believe and we're going to be home before you know it. Jeremiah says, this isn't what God is saying. Yeah. Saying those preachers are preaching fantasies to you based on what you want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my brothers and sisters, which is why uh, if you go to a church and you're never challenged by what you preach, you might be in the wrong church. If every sermon makes you say amen and no sermon makes you say ouch, you might be in the wrong church. If you never have to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, God, how can I be better based on what you said to me today? You might be in the wrong church. Uh, which is why, my brothers and sisters, I'm so glad that I'm here preaching for Pastor Harper because I know Pastor Harper preaches a word that every once in a while steps on some toes. I know it because I've seen your shoes and I can see the footmarks on it every once in a while, my brothers and sisters. It happens every once in a while, but I want somebody who doesn't mind stepping on my feet every once in a while because I need a word that is based in the reality of my situation. I 
don't need a preacher who is going to have me shouting my way to destruction. Which is why, my brothers and sisters, sometimes we need to turn off some of our favorite televangelist preachers. Sometimes we need to turn off the radio on some of these preachers that be on the radio. Uh, some of these big name preachers with big audiences, with uh, mega ministries, with uh, minor impact, my brothers and sisters. Sometimes we need to turn them off because they will have you feeling great about yourself and never say what God needs you to hear in this moment. They will have you believe that you can name and claim your way to success, my brothers and sisters, and never equip you for the fight that is ahead of you. Jeremiah said, I want you to know uh, there is a challenge. This, you are going to be in this situation for a little while. And so get comfortable, build homes, plant gardens, learn how to eat the food that's there because you're going to be there, work for the peace of Babylon because the peace of Babylon is going to be your peace. Uh, you've got to be the soul in a country that doesn't honor or recognize God. You've got to be the conscious of a people who lost their way a long time ago. My brothers and sisters, and just like the exiles in Babylon, just like Daniel uh, was the prophet to King Nebuchadnezzar, just like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down and were sent to the fiery furnace, my brothers and sisters, so God needs for us uh, to be the voices for God in this country that has lost its way. This country that continues to fall in love with capital and uh, refuses to fall in love with people. This country that spends uh, seven times more than our nearest, uh, our nearest competitor on our military. While education goes unsolved, while we have people who are hungry, so much so, my brothers and sisters, that if we lower our military spending, so that we only spent six times more than our nearest competitor on our military. We would have enough money to fix every broken school, to feed every person, to pave every road, uh, to fix every bridge, and still have money to make sure that everybody had affordable health care, my brothers and sisters. It's just a matter of our priorities. And so we need a preacher who will remind us that we are to be the conscience of the people. Yeah. That we are to be the conscience uh, to help save this country. Yeah. It's why, my brothers and sisters, getting out to vote in November is not just a political activity. But it's a moral requirement, my brothers and sisters, uh, because our, unfortunately, uh, too many of our white brothers and sisters can't be trusted to save themselves. <laughs> And if you don't believe me, just go down to Alabama. Because there was a man running for Senate in Alabama who was kicked out of the mall. The malls in Alabama said, you can't come here because you have been too predatory towards young women. Who has been kicked out of three offices. He was a judge and they kicked him off the bench. He ran for a city office and they kicked him out of that office. He ran for another federal office and he kicked him out of that. Three offices he had been kicked out of because of his, because he had been predatory towards young girls. And now he was running for Senate. And 98%, uh, it took 98% of black women and 95% of black men to, uh, to vote for his opponent because 60% of white women and 70% of white men Voted for the pedophile. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, uh, the reason why we work so hard to organize get out the vote campaigns is because if we don't vote, it's more than just about the issues of black people. If we don't vote, our nation is gonna go, uh, uh, it's gonna go in the wrong direction. 
Because so many of our white counterparts have fallen victim to the lies, my brothers and sisters. Uh, they have become, they can't see clearly what is happening in front of them because they've been so caught up in this trap of whiteness. But we know, because we know our history. We know that whiteness is not a thing to aspire to, my brothers and sisters. We remember our history. Uh, we know that, my brothers and sisters, that it was that it was not the uh, uh, it was not uh, the beneficence of white people, but it was the prayers of our black mothers and fathers, our black grandmothers and grandfathers that brought us to where we are. There wasn't anybody's generosity that opened the door for us, but it was a movement of God on our behalf that opened the door for us. That's why we've got to get out and vote, because we see clearly what other people miss. Jeremiah is telling them, plant gardens, build houses, work for the peace of Babylon, because its peace will be your peace. He says, but I want you to know that while you were there, God has not forgotten you. Even though you were in a strange land with strange customs. Uh, even though uh, the way they worship doesn't necessarily connect with the way you worship. Uh, even though they will say your God's name and use your God to say things that your God never said. I want you to know that your God has not forgotten you. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Uh, plans to give you a hope and a future. And my brothers and sisters, what we have to understand is that the future of God, the hope of God, is not connected to our immediate situation. But it is connected to our ultimate destiny. In other words, my brothers and sisters, if I were a different preacher, I would get up here and tell you that if uh, you did everything you were supposed to do, you came to church, you gave your tithe and your offering, you went and you prayed, uh, you came to Sunday school, you came to Bible study, you did all these things, that God will bless you and everything will be great. Wow. That you'll get the job you want, you'll get every promotion you deserve, um, that uh, doors will open for you, that you will open up your door in the morning, it will always be sunshine, it will never be rain, that the blue birds will sing your praises uh, on your way to work. I would tell you that, my brothers and sisters, but that's not the case. The case is that sometimes this life is a challenge. Sometimes in this life we must struggle. Yeah. Uh, Jesus said it to his disciples, he said, in this life, yeah. you will have trouble. Yeah. And so anybody who tries to tell you that you can somehow exempt your way out of trouble, they're reading a different Bible than the one I have, my brothers and sisters. Uh, I hear Jesus say somewhere else that God causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on both the just and the unjust. Some days are going to be good days, my brothers and sisters. Other days are going to be bad days. And there's not a prayer, not even the one of Jabez, that can save you from that. But what God has promised is even when trouble comes in your life, that trouble won't have the last word. It's why my grandmother used to sing a song. She would say, uh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my struggles. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. I used to say, grandmother, why do you say glory, hallelujah, after singing the rest of that song? There's nothing in that song to say glory, hallelujah about. And she would say, grandson, I sing glory, hallelujah, because I know that no matter how much trouble I'm in, trouble never has the last word. I can sing glory, hallelujah, because I know that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I can sing glory, hallelujah, because I know no matter how many struggles I go through, there's a God who still sits high and still looks low. I can say glory, hallelujah, because I can say like Job, I might not know where God is. I might not see God's hand, but this I know. I know that God knows where I am, that God can see me. 
And when I come out, I will come out as pure gold. I can sing in glory, hallelujah, because on a Friday night, they hung my Jesus on a cross. On a Friday night, they had whipped him all night long. On that Friday, the sun refused to shine. On that Sunday, it looked like that death had the last word. They took Jesus off the cross and they placed him in a tomb. And he stayed there all day Friday, all day Saturday. But I can say glory, hallelujah, because early Sunday morning, just about the break of day, Jesus got up with all power in his hands. And that same resurrection power that's in Jesus is in you. That same resurrection power that got Jesus up can be with you. So no matter what trouble you experience, my brothers and sisters, you don't have to fret and you don't have to cry because God is right there walking beside you. I wonder if there's somebody that can praise God for the hope we have and knowing that God is with us. Can you praise God for the hope we have that God is right beside us? Can you praise God for the hope we have that God is already working everything out? Come what will or come what may, I can say glory, hallelujah, because I know that my hand is in God's hand. As the music plays, won't you do me a favor? If there was something in that message that was for you, if there was something that you heard, that you heard God speaking to you, a place that was a shout moment for you, or a place that was an ouch moment for you, won't you do me a favor? Don't keep it to yourself, but won't you just turn to your neighbor who's sitting next to you and just share with your neighbor the one piece of that message that was just for you. I want you to turn to him right now as the music is playing to share with your neighbor what in that message was for you. 